Hi, and welcome to the Active Code podcast, brought to you by Aspire Active Partnerships. I'm Paul Griffiths, and joining me each week on the pod is Luke Johnson. Aspire Active Partnerships is a community of like-minded business leaders who all believe that collaboration in the sports coaching and children's activity sector is essential for success. We've proven that working in collaboration does benefit business growth and essentially helps more children be more active more often. To combat physical inactivity, we need organisations that are performing at their very best. Organisations will only operate to high standards if they are led well. So, if we can focus on developing high quality leaders throughout an organisation, not just at the top, customers will experience higher quality services, which means heightened enjoyment levels and increased levels of physical activity. And if we do this at an early age, we know that we can build the foundations for a more active, happier and healthier life. The Active Code investigates what it really takes to be a successful leader and how organisations can combat physical inactivity. We won't be alone through this journey. We are joined by business owners and experts from our sector, as well as inspirational people from outside our industry. We'll understand the importance of physical activity to our guests, reflect on leadership experiences, and gain thought-provoking insights on how we can crack the active code and get more children more active more often. If you like what you hear, please leave us a rating and subscribe wherever you get your pods. Welcome to episode number one of our second series, and what a wonderful way to kick things off. Luke and I are joined by Justin Coleman and Rudro Sen from the Alliance of Sport in Criminal Justice. Justin has extensive knowledge of the criminal justice system, specifically prison and community, and received best practice from HM inspectors for his work with long-term offenders. He was also awarded Prison Officer of the Year in 2009 for his work with young people, amongst other awards for his programme delivery and design. In his current role as co-founder and chief operations officer for Alliance of Sport, Justin has extensive experience in the lead and delivery of projects using sport and physical activity in the criminal justice system. Our other guest, Rudra Sen, has a strong background in the sport for development sector in both the UK and his native Mumbai. Rudra currently works with the Alliance of Sport team in a project management role overseeing an exciting new project that uses sport to address overrepresentation in the youth justice system. Rudro, Justin, welcome to the Active Code podcast. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us. Justin, as co-founder of the Alliance of Sport in Criminal Justice, I think we'll uh, start with you, if that's okay. Can you just give us an understanding uh, a, a bit more about the organisation, please? Uh, sure. Yeah. So I guess in, in relation to the Alliance of Sport, it was. I'm going to I'm going to take you back a little bit further, I guess, and and just say where a colleague of mine, James, you know, James Mapstone, is the the CEO of the Alliance uh, at the moment. Is we we started off in the prison estate, and we used to work together there. Jim uh, James was the gym manager, and um, at the time I was a a drugs worker in there. So in a, in a way, we kind of fell into the sport for development role together many years ago. Um, basically, he did sport, so he was the cool one. Um, and he always used to work really well with the young people. And I was the kind of, I guess I was, I, I progressed them from, um, drugs work into youth offending teams and things. So I sort of did the case management and the group work kind of side of things around sort of emotion management and things like that. Um, and many years later, then James set up, um, the second chance project in the prison. So it was kind of born in there and, um, for basically to, to reduce reoffending through sport or using sport. So it was to reduce that reoffending kind of bracket really. And, after that, then uh, we did that for a number of years, and um, it was brilliant. We worked in multiple prisons, so on and so forth. And then, ultimately, there was a question posed by a, a gentleman in the Ministry of Justice, and he said, "Look, I, I know what the arts can do, and I know what other things can do if you sort of mean to help the criminal justice side." He wasn't certain of sport. Um, now, obviously, during that co- the course of all of that time, we built up an incredibly good network, um, and that network work was of sports organizations of people using sports they weren't necessarily an organization using it but um we decided then we would oh sorry james then we were talking at the time and just saying that we needed an alliance of some description to bring all of these people together um so back in um so that was 2014 that conversation started um and the long story short come to 2017 and and you know it's it's time to sort of set up as a charity not just a project um, so we brought that together then and, and the charity was created, if you will, and as it is now. So the Alliance of Sport, it's gone through a few names, but it's the Alliance of Sport and Criminal Justice. 
And the, um, the idea really is, is that we bring together people from um, criminal justice, from health, um, from all kinds of, um, I guess, from the police right the way through to your prison service, et cetera, bring them together with sports development and sports organisations to assist people through, I guess, the prison system, the criminal justice system, but ultimately back into, you know, long-term sustainable options for their futures. So in other words, you know, out of the criminal justice and into pro-social, proactive sort of citizenship and roles around that. And yeah, it's been a, a privilege really, to be honest, to work with all the organisations we do and see them grow over the number of years that we've been doing it now. So that's kind of a quick overview of where we're coming from, but without we'll talk more on the yeah, great. We'll, we'll certainly dive into a bit more detail as we uh, as the podcast goes on. Uh, Rodro, over over to you. Obviously, relatively new um, to the Alliance for Sport team. Started just before the pandemic hit, so um, not not great. The greatest of timing, I guess. But would you just like to um, give give the listeners a background into into yourself, please? Yeah. So um, I stumbled into the world of the charity sector, um, and I as, as I started working there, I kind of realised that sport for development started becoming a thing and that's kind of what I realized I wanted to get into because sport meant everything to me when I was younger to be to be able to combine sport which was my first love with the charity sector which is something that I fell in love with after st- stumbling into it that kind of got me into the sector in the first place and then my wife is from here and that's kind of what brought me to this part of the world and um and yeah I met James about a year before I joined and it was kind of weird that you know like a year after we had met for the first time I consider myself to be like the third wheel between James and Justin at the moment <laughs> but 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 yeah no it's been brilliant so far uh working on leveling the playing field it's as you mentioned it's been interesting trying to start a project based around physical activity when everyone's in lockdown but um yeah, it's it's looking better now. There's light at the end of the tunnel, so it's exciting. Great stuff, and obviously we'll come on to uh, the the project in more detail um, a little later. Rodro, you said that from a young age, sport meant so much to you. What does physical physical activity and sport mean to you now? What does it mean to me now? Um, honestly, a lot, and I mean. Thinking about the current circumstances, probably more so because there isn't much that you can really get up to except going out once a day for physical activity a few months ago. So I want to say it's what's kept me sane over the past year is being able to go out for runs and um, just, you know, be physically active because, I mean, there's so much evidence around how it improves your mental health and just helps you get out of the house, take a break from the monotony of your daily lives. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what physical activity means to me. And even watching sport, like I think just the fact that we've had access to, you know, football and cricket and just entertainment, it's, it's things that keep you going. So that's kind of what I see when it comes to physical activity. Yeah. Plenty of benefits. Definitely. Justin, do you have similar feelings towards physical activity? (laughs) Yeah, I'd say I do. I I think it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? You grow up with it and you just do it. You don't really think about it too much. You just do it, enjoy it, and then want to do it again. And you don't really think beyond what it's doing for you. If you sort of mean, whereas when you grow up, you get older and you start to analyze things a bit more. I guess that you start to realize that it's it's just it's multiple things, isn't it? Personally, it's great because it keeps you active and physically strong and healthy, mentally as well as physically. But also, I think. It keeps you connected to people in a way that you, you probably take for granted when you're just doing it. Um, and then when you don't and, and say, you know, COVID hit and whatnot and, you know, and the, and the restrictions came into place, you start to miss things. When you start to miss it, then you realize how much, you, and it's that old adage, isn't it? You know, you don't know what you've got until it's gone. And, and I think it's that element of, like you say, when, when Rudra just said then with regards to sport, coming back on telly or on the radio or wherever you want to listen to, watch it, et cetera, you, you miss that not being there. And when it is there, it kind of, brings it back to life again you just feel a bit more excited about your team in the league or in my case I don't but it's kind of it's just where where those things kind of perfume in the community and into your daily conversations and you, you know your, your your morale if you want within teams as well things like that. you don't realize how much sport plays a part in just your general day-to-day stuff as well as the activity itself if that makes sense um so yeah I think it's it's an intrinsic part of our culture um and I say that across culture as well 
Absolutely. What you just said has been echoed on other podcast episodes we've done. It's sport and activity when you're younger just felt like something you just do. And I think for many children and young people these days, it might be a slightly different experience. Um, so, Justin, aside from um, being kept indoors over, over lockdown, how do you keep active? Well, I'm, I'm really privileged. Actually. I've got a dog. Um, so I guess the dog needs walking and, and I'm privileged again to live in a place where I can walk. So I guess it's one of those things I do a lot of. So physical activity around the, the kind of, when I say walking, it's more hiking than anything, but we you know, go out, do as much as we possibly can. I, I've got my, uh, I don't know about branding, but yeah, my Fitbit and whatnot. Obviously I keep my steps high and all those sorts of things. So I challenge myself all the time personally. Um, and it's something in the family as well. We keep going. So we keep talking about, you know, physical activity, you know, steps, et cetera, et cetera. So it's something we're all involved with doing. And then I guess when it comes to sport itself, I miss that. Um, I miss the gym. Um, but, uh, I'm lucky. Hopefully I'm going to be going back shortly. So I've kind of just re-registered if you want. Um, and that's something I'm really looking forward to getting back into. I guess. Um, Rodro, what about yourself? How do you keep active? Um, similar to Justin, I don't think I do enough. I mean, not that I'm saying that that's what Justin said, but <laughs> um, uh, I definitely try to go out for a run at least three times a week. Um, you know, like, and I'm trying to run five k's three times a week. I signed up to a cricket club. Haven't really been for more than one net session because I came back with a really, really sore shoulder. So, um, but um, I mean. Yeah, there's so much access. Like there is a basketball court near me. I've been thinking, all right, might should go and buy a basketball and just shoot some hoops. Like it's that easy. So definitely want to do more. But I think lockdown has definitely encouraged me as well to go out on really, really long walks because you can. So so yeah, that's what we've been doing at least for the past few months. And as we're coming out of the pandemic, um, do you guys think that that will continue in terms of your routines that you've set? You both said you, you walk a lot. So is that something naturally that you think will just continue to happen? Or do you think subconsciously you probably have to um, schedule it into your diaries? Um, I mean, yeah, 100%. Like definitely discovered a new love for walking around London and not having to use public transport. Like, I mean... Yeah, hundred percent. We'll keep that going. Absolutely, and 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 right. I, I think it's something I need to do anyway because the dog needs it. So that's, that's always that importance. If you sort, I mean, it's been there all the time, I, I guess. And to try more sports now is something I'll be doing over the next sort of year or so as well. And making time for it, like you just said, then it's, it's essential because ultimately it'll keep me going in my, trip, my day job. It'll keep me going with my parenting. If you sort, I mean, all those sorts of things that I. I need to do because it's time with my family as well that I can do something with them. So and those things have become even more important now, I think, to hold on to. Yeah, I think it's a case of just completely switching off, isn't it? I think it's um, even going for a walk nowadays, you, it's quite easy just to check the email or, or take a phone call. I know we, we do walking meetings here, which have been really beneficial, um, but there's certainly ways that if you, if you want to take a break during the working day, I'm sure you guys have um, have done calls as well whilst you're walking around. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, there's ways in, in which we can switch off if we need to switch off completely. Um, but especially especially nowadays with kind of life being so busy from a work perspective and if you've, you've got children and in particular a dog just in as well to look after, there's, um, yeah. there's, a, there's, a, lot, there's a lot to think about. Um, yeah. We both spoke about physical activity and the benefits to, to you both. I think, Rodri, you said from a... From a well-being perspective, Justin, is that is that something that, that you feel is very passionately about as well? From a, is physical activity help you from a well-being point of view? One hundred percent, without without a shadow of a doubt. If I didn't do anything physically active, yeah, I wouldn't be able to do my job. Simple as that, I think. Um, ultimately, I, I you know you'd be able to do it for a, maybe a couple of months, but you just crash and burn. It's this it's essential to recharge. It's essential to get your endorphins going. It's essential to be able to get clarity of thought and have that reflective time. If you sort of mean to be able to reflect and think and no, it, yeah, it's an essential part of my life. It's not just something I want to do. It's something I have. How can we promote those benefits to those people who especially aren't engaged in activity or in, in recreational sport? Yeah, I, I guess it, well, we are all the time. The, the brilliant thing with, with what we've got is, an, is networks, if you will. We've got, we've got an incredible set of um, organisations, about 450 organisations across the Alliance of Sport, but leveling the playing field. For example, as far as another potentially around 80 40 delivery 45 delivery partners but you've got your your sort of components on top of that within the youth defending teams and so on and 
the really the great thing is we've never had a conversation where people don't value physical activity. They all value it. So there are role models to those young people. Um, and I think that's that's what is essential within that, that those organizations, within the, the people that we're talking with. And, and I guess it's that element of saying that, you know, this the importance is always there for them. It is for us. And it's just a shared common goal that we've all got that we want to use sport, physical activity to help people. And we know how to do it. We do do that. So I guess those it, the, the elements of um, about whittling on too much, but the criminal justice systems had to restrict movement. It's had to do those things. So that's one of the challenges that we're looking at at the moment is how do we get people active in environments whereby they might be restricted? Um, so in prisons and secure settings, that movement hasn't been as much as they'd hoped. Um, so that's something we're trying to encourage, support, and, and get people positively thinking about physical activity rather than just... Um, you know, rather than it becomes something they must do, it's, it's kind of something they want to do, if you see what I mean. And that's, that's just that encouragement through various channels like advertising, role models, um, you know, taking in new initiatives, new ideas, listening to what those young people, if they're in prison, for example, or if they're adults, listening to what they want, um, and what type of physical activity they're interested in and trying to provide it for them. Yeah, yeah. And again, that's a rec- recurring theme that a lot of people have mentioned in the in previous pods about listening to the audience as such so you know no matter if it's a child who is a five-year-old in in primary school or a parent or someone that is in prison then we need to listen to that that community and understand what their needs are rather than just prescribing something um delivering something that actually they they don't want because it just won't work will it no it doesn't that's exactly the point it doesn't i think Rudra, you you might want to add to that but i guess it's simple is that if you're not doing what people desire choose etc to do it won't be sustainable it just won't it will be something they might do by the off chance and hopefully they pick up a look for it but ultimately what you want to do and start there and then we start to work with people in order to get them more active more often i guess and that's a gentle process it's a choice it's an experiment if you want and make it fun and so on and so on and hopefully it sticks yeah, and Rodro, I noticed that you've got experience. So in Mumbai, you worked on the um, on a big project out in Mumbai, and I guess is that where you kind of really started in the sport for sport for development projects. Do you want to share a little bit more information on that with us? Yeah, absolutely. So I was working on a project called Just for Kicks, which was essentially working with um, I think you call them public schools here, which are government run schools. Um, where you have your low-income young people studying, and we were just, we were taking them through football, but also teaching them life and leadership skills using football as a tool. So essentially, everything that you associate with, say, passing the ball on the football pit, it's communication. So I mean, when we were younger, we had coaches that were teaching us how to kick a ball and things like that, but no one ever correlated life skills to what we were learning on the football pit. But it was literally as simple as that. If you can pinpoint something that you're doing on the football pitch, associate it with a life activity or a leadership skill, then it just becomes so much clearer and you understand things a lot better. So that th- those were the kind of things that we were imparting onto the young people over there. And I mean, we were able to make cultural shifts where, you know, you had Muslim young girls who were taking part in football and things like that without their parents knowing because they weren't in approval of things like that. But then when they came and saw their kids, I mean, play on a football pitch, they felt proud. And now we've got role models in those cities where those girls have become coaches within those communities. And and, and that's the thing. You just listen to what they want. Like these girls wanted to play football. So they went against what their parents wanted them to do initially and broke culture, sort of changed cultures, essentially. So there's so much success stories that sport can cultivate within each person that's just beautiful to watch. So, yeah. Great work. Love it. Rudro, the latest Sport England Active Live survey shows that black, Asian and minority ethnic children are less physically active. So perhaps now is a good time for you to introduce the Leveling the Playing Field project that you're leading on. Brilliant. So Leveling the Playing Field kind of stemmed from David the David Lammy's review, the Member of Parliament from over three years ago, where he also um, identified that there was an overrepresentation of young people from ethnically diverse communities in the criminal justice system. So what this meant is while the number of total number of young people were decreasing in the criminal justice system, 
the number of young people from ethnically diverse communities were increasing. So that was the problem that was identified. And as you mentioned, Sport England also identified that these same young people are also underrepresented when it comes to physical activity. So those essentially are the two common goals when it comes to leveling the playing field is increasing the level of participation of young people from ethnically diverse communities in physical activity, at the same time preventing and diverting young people from ethnically diverse communities from being involved in the criminal justice system. So we again, as you guys have been talking, we wanted to do everything from a local voice. So we went to the local strategic partners being the active partnerships in each of the region. Um, so it's a national project in four different regions across the country. So we've got London, West Midlands, South Yorkshire and Gwent in Wales, where we're working with 40 delivery partners and 60 mentors to essentially level the playing field using physical activity. Um, it, 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 I could go on and on about the project and it can be slightly complicated, but I hope that's a quick and easy introduction to what we're looking to do. But let me know if you want more detail. No, that's brilliant. Thank you for, for outlining it, Rudro. Um, and sticking with that, so why does, in your opinion, physical activity and sport in particular help reduce crime, violence and reoffending? Um, I mean, I can start answering that to just sort of say that just improvement in one's health and well-being just creates a better character and that should essentially stop people from getting into the criminal justice system. But I will pass this question on to Justin because he'll be able to articulate it better being having the experience in the criminal justice system, if that's okay. Yeah, I don't know if I'd be able to do it better, but I'll have to go. In, in relation, it's, just so, it's so complicated and complex. I think with, with human beings, okay, we, we want role models. We, we want aspiration. We want to aspire to things. And I think ultimately... When it comes to sport and physical activity, we know that there are abundant, there is an abundance, if you will, of, of, of role models and physical well-being and mental well-being, et cetera, within it. But also there's resilience in it. And ultimately, it's, it's only in the fact that young people are facing, and, and, you know, not to point phrases, but in a way of unprecedented kind of issues at the moment um, across mental health, et cetera, et cetera. And those in the criminal justice system are the same. Um, there could be, and we don't know what the... the, the Kind of next phases are, but there could be a lot of issues that needed to be addressed. And I think sport has a fundamental role in in sort of supporting that that kind of recovery. Um, in that, it's it's outdoors, it's connected with people. So, from from our perspective, sport itself is a um, is a community. It can be a very vibrant and very positive community to be a part of. As I said before, you kind of when you're younger, you take things for granted. Sometimes they're just there. Um, and I think it, if we can establish groups, um, so level and plan for um, participation sessions, get the mentors up together, you know, which they are being trained at the moment, get them up together so that they're actually able to connect young people to those physical activity sessions. That in itself is a community which is positive, which is driving forward kind of some young people's lives in a, in a direction that sport will, will take it, which is a positive step forward. And what that also then does, it enables young people to test out their ability within social settings. Um, it also to test themselves out within, as uh, Ridro alluded to just now, in, in a sense of leadership, um, social, um, social identification, sorry, where they are, who they are and where they fit. And there's, some brilliant re- there's a research team as well with University of Birmingham and, and Morgan there, who's the, the researcher, who came up with an article just recently around uh, basically the headline being that you can't be what you can't see. And I think that's, that phrase alone and that, that kind of part there is, is what sport can offer is, is an opportunity for young people to see people like them positive um, role models resilience etc so it's not just about focusing on the, the positive if you will it's about okay let's break this down let's make this into a, a step-by-step kind of process that at the moment I'm feeling really bad I want to feel better and what's the journey in between and I think we sport allows you to plan those things take those steps in a safe environment which ultimately you wouldn't necessarily get and, and you know within um, some community settings, if you want, it's kind of hard, you know, it's difficult to find that positive sometimes. So by putting a session on, people can go there and find all of those resources for resilience if they want. So I think sport's got that catch-all, really. Um, as long as you've got the right staff in there as well, in which they all are, they're brilliant. And I think it's just about being able to highlight those young people that whatever you want is possible. You might have to work hard at it, but it is possible. Um, and you can be what you can see. 
so it's that element of um, switching it from the deficit, if you want, to the positive. Which um, yeah, that short quote is so simple but so true. Absolutely. Yeah. Just on aspirational um, role models, there's a testimony on, on your website that I saw that said, "I love the Alliance because it's full of inspirational people." So, how have you created a team of inspirational people? Well, uh, I think it, it all starts with relationships, and I think this goes back to what I was just talking about. Actually, um, relationships are key within sport, whether it's a coach, uh, you know, uh, a young person attending a session or, or an adult attending a session. It also goes out to the family, and that the family feel like they're young, the, the young people that they maybe have sent to those sessions, they're seeing progress. Um, and I think what we've been able to do is is identify and work with over many, many years. As I said, this goes back probably, well, for me, 1997, I've been working with people since then. And across the piece, we've, we've met people we've worked with and and we've just developed kind of friendships, if you want, across the network. Um, and those relationships are, are incredibly powerful. And they also allow us to learn from our mistakes, but also learn, learn from our successes too. And I suppose that's that team, when we invited them together as a steering group initially, um, we invited in a lot of organisations together um, and key representatives of those organisations from public health right the way through to, you know, organisations like Sported and, and various others, you know, all the sporting and sort of um, criminal justice bodies. And um, we, we came together. Everyone knew that sport was kind of a good thing, but not necessarily knew exactly why. Um, and I think the question posed really at the beginning, as I said, through the Ministry of Justice was, you know, I, I want to know more about sport. And it's kind of, I think everyone around the, the room wants to do the same. So it's those common goals that allows us to develop something together and have a, an open dialogue, really. Um, and I think the team then has become very open. Um, our network is very open and honest with each other. Um, we're able to sit and listen and validate each other, if you will, and, and help each other as much as we possibly can. Because no matter how big or small our organisation is, we, we've all got a part to play. And I think it's just about enabling those parts to come out and the voice to come out equally so that we're all able to drive forward um, a common theme. We've all got our specialisms, absolutely, and we've all got our, our restrictions as well in many cases when it comes to whether it's financial or whether it's education or policy. But we're able to bring that together in a room and just open it on it and say, right, what can we do about it then? And, and that has happened a lot. And I think it's those, we were talking about this this morning actually in, in another meeting, um, Richard, as well, but in relation to just being open, honest and Understanding where we're vulnerable, understanding where we're, we, we need to strengthen up uh, and talking about that, but also looking at where we're strong and, and bringing people together and, and being able to help share agendas um, and work on things together in a way that, uh, that is supportive ultimately for the beneficiaries, which is the young people in this case, in, in this conversation. Uh, it impacts on so many, you know, the staff themselves, as well as parents, families, communities itself. Um, we start to see that and share that. and build up those relationships along the way so you know trust builds therefore more projects build it yeah, i think cultures um this is so important isn't it it sounds like you've got a, a great culture that you've you've built in the organization there and and one that will no doubt have a positive impact on those uh young people that you're working with as well in the various projects that you run um i think naturally i, I guess guys you you see a um a positive a more positive effect on those young people for organizations that have that positive culture um, it just naturally naturally um, transitions down, doesn't it? So when it, you've got a whole host of experience, both of you, um, working with various organisations and working with teams of people. Um, but when it comes to leadership roles, what are your proudest achievements to date? Um, I, th- I think we've already said, we, yeah, I think the pro- it's a good question because there's so many and, and I think there's so many, whether it's personal, whether it's with other people. From, from my point of view, it's, 100 percent it's just the fact that I, I sit there and listen to the, the network and, and i'm talking about the wider context in the sense of um, conversations with organizations in, in different parts of the country I, I speak with a great person um and i'll just, just highlight one for example but out of lancashire you've got jay moody up there i had a conversation with you today um and she's an absolute just brilliant organization and what they're doing is they're linking in with the rest of the parts of the network as well and talking with them my proudest achievement really is, is, is a constant thing, but it's, it's that ability that, that the network are coming together and they're developing projects and understanding and, and that leadership then from their perspective, locally driven, um, is cross pollinating and it's starting to, to build a really strong, vibrant network of 
can-do attitudes if you want across different communities that are coming together now and starting to be um, more resilient. And I, I'm never not blown away by the fact that people are they're just so positive. Like, even though the chips might be down, they're still positive and they're still going to go for it and they're still making headway. And it's just no matter what life throws at them, they come back and they're resilient. And I think that that then just rubs off on me and it's just so hopefully it's a case of it being a, a kind of a reciprocal constant i think um a high of of kind of what is actually happening out there it's just it's all positive even if it's a negative situation something positive will come of it and that's I, I can't say one thing it's it's just constant um and I'm, I'm just really proud of the network i think we're all doing an amazing thing they're working with some of the most complex situations if you want and people but always managing to navigate their way around it and be sustainable and, and some vibrant outcomes, but I don't, Rudra probably got some great examples from. I think, I mean, just to add to that, I, I mean, just echoing what Justin's saying is that the network really is one of the proudest things that we can talk about. At least for me, over the last year, we've built this network of organizations that are already doing amazing work. And talking about leaders, I feel like we've met so many leaders within all of these communities that are really, really inspirational. Like, they're all from ethnically diverse communities doing absolutely amazing work. And we just want to give them that voice and actually celebrate the amazing things that they're doing. So I think, yeah, through through this project and through the work that we're doing, we really want to just give amplify their services and all, all of their leadership skills. And I think through the network, we're able to share what each other's doing with each other. And that's something we've seen, like where somebody in Gwent has experienced something They've, they felt isolated over the past six months about what they're experiencing. And then they have a conversation with someone in South Yorkshire and they're just like, Oh, you're going through exactly the same thing in a completely different part of the country. So maybe we need to talk to each other and share that best practice. So I think those are the kind of things that we've seen over the past six to eight months that have been absolutely beautiful to watch. And Rudra, you've shared the amazingly proud moments, including facilitating that network of incredibly, incredibly positive people and organizations what it's, would you say it's is slightly the biggest challenge you've had I mean, today we've, we've been locked up and haven't been able to do in person so i don't know whether that's just the obvious and easy answer to go to um but that being said um <laughs> what is the biggest challenge i think <laughs> i'm trying to think of something that's over and above covid <laughs> but it's really difficult given the circumstances because yeah like the biggest challenge is not being able to deliver physical activity to people but i mean this and i can only think of positive things again because these community organizations and leaders that i've been talking about have come up with brilliantly innovative ways to mitigate that and actually enable physical activity um through virtual methods so i don't know i'm really stumbling with this one i'm sorry but it just shows how well you've coped with the, with the last 12, 15 months, really, you've managed to turn slightly negative situations to a lot of positive ones, which, which is brilliant. Is there anything, Justin, from your point of view that over the years has been a been a big challenge that you've had to overcome? No, I think ultimately it, it, it's also actually during COVID. So during those times, during the, the lockdown periods, I suppose we've had a lot of themes come up as well. And I think waves of, of problematic social issues, you know, from, from Black Lives Matter right the way across. And I think it's not been, it's not so much they, they are obviously social issues that need to be addressed. And that's something we're very much focused on. But I think there's been quite a few of those social issues that are coming up. And I think they're still ongoing, you know, in a sense of whether it be equality, uh, or in this case now, I think we've got a wave of mental health coming up now. We're in mental health week. So it's very, very much focused around those things and it's consistent. And I think that, that also adds to the pressure of time, which is, you know, during, um, in sort of restrictive times, I guess, or restrictions, it's been re- it's been a challenge to maintain communications. It's been a challenge to keep, I think, up to the level of operations that we've been doing. Because you know, when you're doing it via virtual means, it's it's been back to back, been exhausting at times. It really has. And I think, you know, we've got to be honest about that. Can we carry on as we are? I don't know. This is the challenge that we're facing at the moment. Is is around capacity, isn't it? In time, and I think it's um, now that we're seeing a shift. There's delivery happening. We're starting to see that time being used in a different way. So I guess it's just managing what we had been doing for the past year and sort of transferring that over to now a more physical means of communicating as well as a, 
digital one and what does that look like in the future, but also whilst being, being very mindful of the social issues and the mental health implications that this could have as well, so that we need to just keep mindful and keep aware of, of what's going on around us. So, yeah, capacity has been a challenge, I'll be honest. You know, you, you're working late at night. I've been, we were doing um, sort of calls very late at night, very early in the morning and so on, because the Alliance is, is also um, it's got international members and things like that as well. So, you know, we've been communicating and keeping people informed and working with to understand their circumstances and their situations. And it's, it's been incredibly valuable, don't get me wrong, but it's also been exhausting. So from a personal perspective, I'm just reflecting on that. And that, that is one of the challenges moving forward as to how do we sustain and maintain our own physical and mental well-being to, to help others with theirs, you know. Um, so and, and also the social issues that reappearing, you know, um, equality issues, health inequalities, etc. Managed to address now that we we're determined to do something about it, but uh, obviously that will take very much. Uh, well, it will take a, a very united approach to make sure that we address the pandemic. Justin, I think we, we can't really get through this without going into a bit more detail around the pandemic and and the impact we think it's had, and obviously the impact. Well, the, the impact I should say that we know it's had, um, and then the impact we think it could have going forward. Is that going to shift the focus of what Alliance of Sport do? Or has it shifted the focus? No, I think it's it's probably concreted it more. Actually, I think um, we know that those those the inequalities, yeah, as as Richard said, then that we've got overrepresentation of ethnic and diverse young people in the system. That's still the case. Um, so what it's done is probably shut our minds a little bit more as to what we need to do as a as an organisation. Um, obviously, there are hundreds of issues out there we could address, um, but we have to be crystal clear on what it is that we can address. Um, and with the expertise that we've got as Rudro and, and, you know, James and all other colleagues as well, we're, we're very much focused on the bits that we can do at the moment and, and that we will do. Um, and that's what we just, you know, we're sharpening those things up at the moment and saying, actually, this is even clearer now than it ever was really as to what we, we feel we need to be doing. Um, and not be sidetracked from that anymore, you know, and, and you know, as organizations grow, you, you kind of follow trends, don't you? Sometimes where you follow funding streams, et cetera. We're a lot more clear on what we need to do. And it's given you almost like crystal clear clarity, I guess, on in, in terms of what you're here to do as an organisation. Is that right? Because that's, I guess, as a as a as a business owner as well. There's, you're right. There's times where you you think you know where your focus should be, and then something happens and it gets shifted, and you're like, actually, do you know what? That wasn't our focus after all. We really need to focus on on this instead. Is that is that pretty much similar where you you guys are as well? Absolutely, I'd say so. Yeah, we, we we know we we know what needs to be done, and I think that's the we knew what the needs were before. Don't get me wrong, but but there were often things that swayed us to and from that, whether it be funding or whether it be social issues, or, or just maybe it's it's maybe about the things that you felt you could do at the time. Whereas now we're a little bit more um, established, we're we're developing those strategies, and we've listened for such a long time now to the communities and and the network and what they want. Um, now it's time to provide them with what they need really as well just just um moving on to our network of listeners that will be tuning into this episode so we sit in the sports coaching and physical activity sector what do you think we can learn from other sectors to combat physical inactivity um well i mean i'm privileged i think actually i'm doing a a leadership course at the moment so i'm working um, at the university and, and studying on that, and I'm really privileged to be doing that with 11 other different sectors, if you will. So there's representation from leaders from across 11 other sectors. The really fascinating thing there is that it's twofold, actually. I think what we've got is the ability to um, look at staff. And I think when we start looking at the staff and the capacity and the mindsets and the, and the health and the well-being, if you will, of those staff and workforces, that's a common thread across ours and all 11 other sort of sectors, if you will, that are in that course. And it's been a really interesting and deep conversation that we've had around how they're going to address that, whether it be financial or whether it be, um, you know, activities or whether it's going to be looking at their infrastructure and the way in which they run their organization with rewards, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, but we're all focused on the same thing, which is we, we want to look after people. Um, it's all about people as the, the thing that, that people are focused on. So, just to answer that, I guess, in relation to other sectors, I think we need to look at how they're treating people. 
um, and then maybe reflect on that and look at, at the sports sector and how we're treating our staff and our, our beneficiaries. But also then maybe sharing some of what we are doing with other sectors too, because it's, it's that twofold part is, I think there's a lot to learn from us, but I know we've got a long way to go and a lot to learn, but that, that also works both ways. I think there's something we've got to share as well, which is of value to, to the corporate, the private sector, the public sector, sort of uh, institutions as well as, if you see what I mean. So in relation to, to, to where I think we can learn from others, absolutely the processes and systems and, and the ways in which they approach those things is something we can always be mindful of and, and, and work with and look towards their outcomes and, and their, you know, their processes to use. But, um, yeah, it's, it's been a fascinating conversation around those elements around other sectors, which is what I think ultimately always boils down to people and looking after them. But, yeah, Roger, I don't know if you've come across any within the, in your, in your areas, but I think that's ultimately what it is. You just need to reflect on that shared problem. Mm -hmm. Of, of kind of how do we do deal with our workforce in a, an effective way that maintains, sustains, enables them to grow, learn, develop, and stay in the sector? Because, um, you know, to be honest, I think the sports sector itself and the leisure sector has quite a fluid, transient nature to it. Some of it's part time. Um, you know, some a lot of it's volunteering in the sport for development world as well. So, how do we hold on to that skill set and that knowledge? Um, and I think that's something that we can learn from other areas. Or even just in pulling people in from other sectors. I think you know, you're quite quite right in saying it's very fluid in terms of we seem to create um, placements and careers for certain people that see it as a short-term stepping stone into something else. Um, rarely do we see people, I think, come come from other sectors into our sector to really have that impact. Um, well, I've not seen that anyway, unless, I'm, unless that's something that I'm... I'm I've just completely missed, but do you, you were kind of on the same lines as that. Do you, do you see people coming into the sector who can bring that experience from other sectors? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, actually, it's, it's, it's strange that because I think within the sport for development world, you do see that a lot more because what you'll see then is, you know, a drugs worker, like I was, you know, I was a drugs worker and, and I, I happened to meet James at the time who was, he was a prison manager, prison PE manager, actually, sport, you know, so he loved his sport. And then that's just something you use and utilize. And then it became an accident that came into this sort of sphere, if you want, of sport. And as the same within the criminal justice system, when you look at that, is sport isn't often the first choice for someone. But when they see how beneficial it can be for them, it does bring them into the sector. So I guess it's, um, and that's just an example, I guess, in criminal justice or, or health, like the health sector itself. You know, a lot of that transition over to sport happens. And, Bridger, I think you gave a, think a great example just now where you, you fell into it. Yeah, and I was actually just going to say that, I mean, I, I, I can't say too much about things here, but back in India, like we've seen a lot of like sport for development is still really niche. It, it's not like the charity sector is niche. When, when some people find out that I'm working in the charity sector, they're almost just like, do you get paid to do that? Like that, that's, those are the kind of questions you get asked. So, um, with it being so niche, you, you, you find these people who've got, a lot of love for sport and like, you know, that's their passion, but they've gone into corporate lifestyles and corporate jobs and they're in the consulting industry, you know, earning a lot of money, but then you see people burning out and then they start meeting people like us and, and it, it, it inspires them. And that's something that I've seen happening back in India is a lot of people leave their corporate jobs and those lifestyles. They obviously take a salary cut, but I mean, it just, it, it's more fruitful to be in the social sector and especially using sport as which which is something that everyone loves at the end of the day. So that's something I've seen a lot back in India. Yeah, and 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 again, I've, I've heard that in across the network that we've got as well that there's a lot of people, especially during furlough um, times when you know people have kind of been they've lost their job. What did they fall back onto? And 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 it got, gave them time to reflect. And I think leadership from other organisations that traditionally aren't sport at all, the individuals have missed their impact. And then, so from that, what they've then looked towards is other sectors and started to learn. I think sport's always been an appealing thing for people because they, you see progress in front of you and it gives you that purposeful reward, if you sort of mean and things. So, yeah, often I think there's an opportunity to, to sell it to, to other sectors, but vice versa, I think that that will pull more leadership in and it could pull in, you know, whether it be frontline, but just to, just to one point there around, if you think about a Saturday coaching team, a football coaching team, young young children, the coaches are volunteers and those volunteers come from all walks of profession. 
um, and they love it and they do it for free um, because it's connected to them personally, maybe their, their community, their children, etc. It's that element of where does sport utilise that a lot? It doesn't at the moment. So it might be a case of, you know, that there is that workforce there which is so cross-sector um, and, and those resources are there on a, on a plate, really. Um, and I suppose it's just how do you capitalise on some of that? And, and more often than not, some of those coaches will fall in love with it so much that they may then come into that sector, into the sport, sports sector, sort of about working in it and operating in it and using the skills they've learned before in this, in this space, whether it be that social media, whether that be finances, whatever it might be, but there's that element of transition into the, the sports sector once you've got a bug for it. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks for sharing that, guys. Um, we always finish off the pod with a, a couple of the same questions. So the, the first one we always ask is, if listeners wanted to enhance their leadership skills, what free books, podcasts, or people would you recommend to them? I, I, I'm not a big reader, so I'm not, I'm not going to be able to quote any books. And then even when it comes to podcasts, I'm very generic when it comes to things like, this might sound cliched, but I am a Man United fan. So I do listen to the Man United podcast, which, you know, you, you <laughs> I can see your head shaking there. <laughs> but I was expecting that sort of reaction. But it, it is always inspirational to listen to, you know, the players that you've watched over the years and listen to their stories. Like, I, I can't wait for the documentary around Sir Alex Ferguson to come out. Like, in fact, maybe I can say that as a book. It is brilliant. Like his autobiography is absolutely brilliant. Like, I mean, those are the kind of books I've read and they are inspirational. And at the same time, I listen to a lot of music podcasts where you go. It's not about listening to the music, but it's actually listening to their stories and, you know, where their inspiration comes from. So so those are the kind of things I listen to. And like, I mean, I know they're not leadership based, but they are inspirational and they kind of help you aspire to be something like that. I don't know. But yeah, that's me. Yeah, I think that's really important. Red Race is a really good point and something that we've not really touched on in the pod before that um, it is important to maybe step away from the leadership side of things and the personal development side of things and actually look at people that you admire and, and look up to. And unfortunately, in your case of being a Man United fan, um, if that person is Sir Alex, then you know, so be it. And you know, if he can, so if you can learn anything that from what he's done over the last year then I think Alliance of Sport and Level the Playing Field project is in a very very good place Justin how about how about yourself um I'm what I'm a bit of a, a nerd and I'm kind of delving into really deep books at the moment so my apologies but I, I mean from from a book's point of view there's a couple that I I found game changing for me um and the first one being a, a book with um so it's Dr. Rachel Anderson is, is basically, she wrote about the Nordic secret. So it was about the Scandinavian um, kind of development of culture, if you will. So over a hundred years ago, for example, is um, about the learning to learn culture. So the adult learning sector and how that kind of influenced then shaped up where they are today. Um, so the Nordic secrets are a recommendation. It's a bit heavy, but ultimately I think it's got a lot of learning in there for, for cultural shifts and changes and various other things. Reinventing organizations by, um, so by Low Act as well as a book and uh, as a podcast and as videos that he's got all sorts of the back of that. So I find that interesting because it talks about, you know, the next steps for organizations really. Um, so from my point of view, it's around organization structure. Again, it, it goes back to, again, leadership in a way as well as to what, what we're looking at next. You know, what is the modern times? And, and, and Nordic Secret touches on that as well is that yes, they've grown to where they are now culturally. Um, the next steps in the digital revolution and various other things, they're not ready for that. And I don't think anyone is. It's kind of short term, et cetera. So it's really interesting. And podcast wise, I guess I, I still love just the banter ones, you know, in the sense of when it comes to, um, you know, that Peter, that, that Peter Crouch and so on. And, and I just find it entertaining. And, and it just is also a really insightful conversation around the changing rooms, around management, around leadership, around all sorts of things. And I, I love it because it's easy listening. But I'm also learning at the same time and just challenging myself. Um, I'm laughing, I guess. Being a Spurs fan, I guess, I'm even more depressed probably than most people at the moment. But, um, yeah, I, I, I would listen to the, the odd podcast and then cry afterwards probably. But um, I'll get there eventually. I think it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a, the biggest mistake actually in my life uh, as a six-year-old boy making that, that kind of vow that I would, I would stick with Spurs. But I have and I will. Um, 
and I'll, I'll take that on the chin. But yeah, so I guess this book, and in films for me, I, I just, I don't know, I'm, I'm a metaphorical individual, so I do like looking at um, things from different perspectives, but I love the little quotes that I think about the films and, you know, just, I just explore as much as possible, if that makes sense, and, and trying to apply it then to the sports world that I'm in. I kind of, I'm a bit of a Marvel fan as well, and I'll take some of that in the sense of where, you know, the comic books are taking some of the themes at the moment and challenging social norms and issues and sort of reflecting on where that's in our society today. And final question. Um, I'm going to open it up to, to both of you, actually, if you want to both give an answer. What one thing does our sector, so physical activity and sport, need to do to crack the active code and get more children more active more often? Um. Oh, yeah, I thought about this one actually in a, in a way then before it, it, I think from my perspective, it's not always to just focus on the young people and the children, it's to focus on the family, it's to focus on the adults in the world as well, because the resources tend to go into the young people, great, and that's brilliant. But the people around them are the ones that will sustain that beyond, um, you know, beyond the projects, beyond the, the funding often, you know, when that runs out, what happens next? Or if there's a funding cut somewhere, what happens next? Can we see the impact of that? So if we focus on the family unit and start to drive some of that, um, you know, that commonality, that, that kind of common goal around physical activity and what it can do and explain that to a family, a mum, a dad, et cetera, how important this is. And we'll see sustainable systemic changes. Pointless working at one end of a spectrum, if you will, um, and not changing the other end because as soon as that project stops, uh, and the family aren't active, then that young person Will fall back to their their, def- their de- default if you want, which is around them. Um, as I said, going back to that quote, you can't be what you can't see. So if you if you see people around you physically active as well, mum, dad, etc., family, going for nice walks, etc., those sorts of things. If that happens, that young person will do that beyond the projects or beyond the services, in between services. So when there's a school holiday, for example, we, we we've always seen this. young people come back from school holidays, especially the long one. They come back less active less fit etc well, that shouldn't happen they should be more fit they should be they should be coming back to school in september more able more uh, you know more physically active than they were before because ultimately the holiday should be full of activity um so yeah i guess it's working with the family and the community around them which which some of the projects we're doing are they're working with those communities for those that have got um you know complex settings if you will it might be it's easy to say that but obviously multi-story block of flats it's quite hard to get out and about but ultimately if the family know what's important i think they're more likely to do it so from my perspective it's helping that wider influence become more educated and more um aware really of, of where it's tough to follow that to be honest but i think connected to what he did say i think is just like providing access to role models and i think that's kind of what i was getting at is where if they can see people in front of them achieving things using sport and physical activity i think that just encourages them a lot more to do the same like i think that's what young people need is inspirational role models to you know aspire to become and i think that's something that we we'll keep trying to do through leveling the playing field as well Absolutely. And, and, and just to finish on that one as well with the role models, just is that if they're local, I mean, I get it. You know, we're going to get the superstars out there in the world and, and they're amazing people and they've tried hard. That's, that's evident. But it is those role models that are tangible. They're in their communities, in their homes, even, you know, it's, it's that looking up to someone. And yeah, those role models are really, really important. And we need to celebrate those more. Definitely. Brilliant. And what a, what a great way to finish the, um, the podcast as well there. I think it, yeah, 100% there's, those role role models, if they're local in the communities as well, it's um, so more impactful. So more impactful. And, and, you know, obviously, the importance of those uh, big stars in the in the sporting worlds, etc., are are very important. And outside the sporting worlds, but you know, if you've got people in communities that are are great role models, then um, it really does help those children, young people, and their families. Um, guys, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a really good um, episode. Really insightful again. Um, love the uh, the quotes around you, you can't be what you can't see um, and the, you know, the importance of positive role models is something that really sticks for this episode um, and the, the journey I think the, you, what really kind of resonates with me is the journey that you've both spoke about the importance of taking people through that journey and, and not just running a project for the sake of it um, and trying to achieve an outcome but actually really looking at what the community needs talking to people 
finding out what they need and and showing them what it looks like and then taking them through that process is so so important and hopefully we'll see big impacts or continued impacts from the projects that you guys are running um in particular on level leveling the playing field um project sounds really exciting Redro. um i wish you all the very best with that project um and look forward to finding out more about the impact of that project so just to finish guys you just share where we can find out more about uh, the projects that you're doing uh, whether it be via your website or on social media platforms all right so you can find us on leveling the playing field.org and also on twitter as ltpf uk and then just for the alliance as well then we've got um the alliance of sport.org and uh, on the twitter then we've got alliance of sport so by all means you know that, that's where you can find out the information um, there's news articles and things and, and newsletters to sign up to on both of those. So, you know, more than welcome to sign up and, and we can share that information then in the progress. Great, Great stuff. stuff. And I know collaboration is massive for you guys and you spoke about that a hell of a lot during this pod. So if people want to get in touch with you and talk about collaborating, what's the best place to do that? Yep. Again, I guess there's the, the websites themselves and, and um, obviously on social media, they can reach out and reach through. Um, and I guess then there's also, um, you know, email is on there. So by all means, but, you know, there's there's a contact page on there as well and then genuinely through my own personal um twitter feeds probably the best one i think so that's just one just in that spell just j-u-s-t one as in o-n-e and then justin and that's on the twitter one and i certainly don't mind anyone direct messaging me as is uh, well yeah they can if they want but that way and then we'll we'll, we'll sort of respond in accordingly and, and take it from there brilliant thanks very much for your time take care and speak soon thanks Paul thank you very much join us next time for the Active Code podcast remember to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode you can connect with us on Twitter at Aspire underscore partners and find out more about us and the network at www.aspireactivepartnerships.co.uk